Hello everyone, I hope you are all safe and healthy during this time. My name is Danielle Griffin and I am a senior psychology student here at Mars Hill University. Over the past few months, I've had the privilege to analyze the relationship between diet and stress. Specifically, I wanted to answer the question, can what we eat affect our moods and our stress levels? So stress is something that we all experience, we've all felt what that's like. However, prolonged periods of stress can lead to psychological disorders such as depression and anxiety. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, these are the two most common forms of mental illness in the United States. Depression affects nearly 17.3 million individuals in the U.S. each year, while anxiety affects 19.1% of the population each year. So what does this have to do with our eating habits? Well, it has been seen in previous research that healthier diets such as the Mediterranean diet and the Tuscan diet are correlated with lower levels of stress. And this segues ourselves into a relatively new field of psychology entitled nutrition psychology, where Various diets or supplementation is utilized in efforts to treat those affected by mental illness. Last semester, when I was first researching this information, I decided to compare different diets. I looked at the Mediterranean diet, the vegan diet, vegetarian, and the keto diet. And all across the board, I found that the Mediterranean diet is the most highly recommended diet when we're talking about stress reduction. The reason being that a lot of the foods characteristic of the Mediterranean diet, such as fruits, vegetables, fish, legumes, are really rich and high in antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties. These properties help lower the level of inflammation in the body, which in return help us cope with stress more easily. Now, I wanted to analyze these sorts of statistics on our very own campus. So, I decided to carry out my own correlational study in efforts to analyze the relationship between eating patterns, stress, and mood among students on the MHU campus. In order to do so, I used self-report surveys that analyze both long-term and short-term levels of stress, mood, and eating habits. I hypothesized that students who reported healthier eating patterns would also report lower levels of stress and a more positive affect or a more positive mood. In terms of my research design, I had a total of 64 participants aged 18 to 25 years. And they were all recruited from psychology and health courses in exchange for extra credit in those courses. The three instruments that I used were the Perceived Stress Scale, the Positive and Negative Affect Scale, and the Eating Habits Survey. Let's look at these a little closer. The Perceived Stress Scale is a 10-question survey that analyzes how well students have handled being upset, been able to handle personal problems, and been able to control irritations. These are in order to analyze their levels of stress. The second scale, the positive and negative affect scale, is a 20 question survey that analyzes mood. So to what extent students have felt interested, excited, nervous, ashamed within a given period of time. The third survey that was used is the eating habits survey, which is a list of food and beverage types to which students had to report which type of foods they were consuming and to what extent they were consuming them. Now, after I had all of my data for this survey specifically, I split the food groups into Mediterranean foods and non-Mediterranean foods. I used the USDA guidelines for healthy Mediterranean eating to do so. This will become important later in the presentation. As for the procedures, those who signed up to participate received a link to an online survey via a survey platform called REDCap. Students completed surveys for both a 30-day or long-term focus as well as a 4-hour or short-term focus. Now, half of the 
participants completed the long-term focus questions first and then completed the short-term focus questions, while the other half completed the opposite order. This is a technique called counterbalancing that is used in efforts to demonstrate that the results are not affected in any way by the order of the focus. Okay, so let's look at some of the results. I'm going to take you back to math class because we're going to look at these two charts right here called scatter plots. Okay, now each of these individual dots represents individual responses from participants. And depending on how these dots are clustered together, we can determine whether or not there's a there's no relationship, there's a positive relationship, or there's a negative relationship. So here on the y-axis we can see 30-day or long-term Mediterranean food consumption and on the x-axis we can see stress. Now in the second chart we can see 30-day or long-term non-Mediterranean food consumption compared to stress. So the Mediterranean foods represent healthy eating patterns while the non-Mediterranean foods represent unhealthy eating patterns. As you can see in both of these graphs, there, there's a slight incline in both of these, but it is not enough to quite, not quite enough to be deemed a significant piece of information. So it can be concluded that there is no real relationship between long-term eating habits, whether or not that's healthy or unhealthy, and stress levels. The second piece of long-term data is positive mood. So again, the food consumption is on the y-axis, and positive mood this time is on the x-axis. So we can see again, there is that slight incline, but it's not really enough to be significant. So we can conclude that there's no real relationship between long-term eating habits and positive mood. The last piece of long-term data I have for you is analyzing food consumption with negative mood. So we can see in this first one Mediterranean food consumption and negative mood. Again, it's that slight incline but it's not quite significant enough. However, when non-Mediterranean food is analyzed with negative mood, we can see a significant positive correlation between these two factors. And we know this is significant because it has a p-value of 0 0.035, which is less than 0 0.05. So what this graph is demonstrating is that those who reported unhealthier eating patterns also reported more negative mood over a long-term period. Now let's take a look at the short-term data. So this is students who have reported within the past four hours. So we can see four-hour Mediterranean food consumption with stress on both of these, non-Mediterranean food consumption with stress. And there's no real significant relationship here. However, when we look at short-term eating habits compared with positive mood, we see that there is a significant positive relationship between healthy eating and positive mood. And we know this is statistically significant because the p-value is 0 0.026, which again is less than 0 0.025. I'm sorry, 0 0.05. Now you can see, or I'm sorry, this can be interpreted to say that those who reported healthier eating habits over a shorter period of time also reported having a more positive mood. Okay, and now we're going to look at non-healthy foods compared with positive mood, and there's no real relationship here. Now let's take a look at our last piece of data for short-term eating patterns. This is looking at negative mood compared with the eating, habit, eating patterns and we can see there's no significant relationship here. So what can we conclude from all of these graphs that I've just presented to you? 
we can see that these are the two most significant pieces of data that I was able to analyze, and they can be interpreted in different ways. This first one was long-term eating habits compared with negative mood, and we can see that those who reported unhealthier, consuming more unhealthier foods also tended to have a more negative mood. As for the short-term piece of data we have, it can be found that those who reported healthier eating habits over a shorter period of time also reported tended to be in a more positive mood. So those are the two most significant pieces of data that I came across in my research. Now, as always, with any type of research, you're going to have your limitations. For me, I had outliers or pieces of data that were far from the mean group of data, so those had to be uh, taken out. I also had extreme answers that suggested that some students just went through and clicked through um, clicked which buttons were most convenient for them. So those had to be eliminated. And lastly, I had students that didn't complete every question. So all of that data had to be eliminated as well. Secondly, when you work with self-report surveys, they're not always going to be accurate because oftentimes there will be a bias put in there or people will false report information just in order to look better on paper. And lastly, correlation does not equal causation. For example, just because a person reported short-term positive mood with healthier eating habits, there are other factors that could affect those findings. For example, he or she could have just received a college acceptance letter or received a text from a significant other. There are other factors that can't be measured using correlational research. Now I just have some food for thought for you guys. One thing that I've learned throughout my entire time at Mars Hill, but really within this past semester, is that research is never instantaneous. You are not going to receive the results that you want to see on the first go, and oftentimes repetition is necessary. Secondly, my hypothesis was not totally confirmed for this research. I'll remind you, my hypothesis was that those who reported healthier eating patterns would also report lower stress and more positive mood. So for stress and long-term positive mood, those could not be confirmed. However, when it came to short-term positive mood, my hypothesis was confirmed that those who reported Healthier eating habits also reported a more positive mood on the short-term time frame. Lastly, this leads us into a questioning, what is the future of nutrition psychology and what is its role in treatment for those affected by mental illness? We can see how these diet and stress relationships point towards a mind-body connection that all of us can benefit from. These are the resources that I used to compile all of my information in this presentation. And this is just a portion of the sources that I used. However, there, there really is so much more to learn about this interesting topic. And lastly, I just want to say thank you to all of you who have been attentive and who who are watching this video right now. I would like to thank the participants who decided to be my guinea pigs and take these surveys so I could conduct this research. I would like to say thank you to the professors that worked with me so that I was able to get this research on the road. And lastly, I would love to give a big thank you to my faculty mentor, Dr. Jana Kwiatkowski. She has been a tremendous help to me throughout this entire process, and I'm ever grateful for her assistance. Lastly, if you guys have any questions, any comments, if you're curious to know more about my data, feel free to shoot me an email. My email is danielle.griffin1 at mhu.edu. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.